because I clicked it. I bored it. Ooh, that's <laughs> my camera did that. You missed the whole golf conversation. <laughs> um, so a library. I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine somebody complaining about a library, except, okay, how's this? Libraries, under federal law, can't exclude homeless people. Mm. Huh? Yeah. All right. Yeah, no. they, they, Fort Lauderdale just lays out the bottom floor of the library in a way that that tries to discourage use by the home. It's it's tough. They can't completely exclude um, the homeless from public libraries. Are they they always hung around there? Yes, that's one reason. I mean, the park, the park next door is another reason that it's kind of an attractive for homeless population. So someone might object to a library because they're concerned that it's going to become a magnet for the homeless population to use the bathrooms, to use the free internet. And in fact, libraries do become that to some extent. Are they, are they still building libraries? They're kind of obsolete now, in my opinion. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. No, libraries will never be oh obsolete. I was just wow. wow. <laughs> this is what I think Welcome to 2019. Wow. Um, <laughs> if you have kids, you know, the kids need to have books in their hands, tactile, something tactile to turn the pages, right? And we'll always need libraries in some form. But, a library. So there you go. So some community may embrace a library or another civic building, and some other community may object because the 24-hour nature of the civic building, if it is one of those, like a police station, could cause noise, lights overflowing, um, or become an attractant to an element that they don't want. Um, not have an adverse effect on the property values. I mean, you make, there's, you always have a good argument though, right? That for a civic or public use building, that you, can, you have to think beyond the neighborhood, you have to think about the good of the entire community. They have to be placed somewhere, and we think this site is good because we're gonna buffer it, because we're gonna <coughs> secure, we're gonna secure the perimeter, we're going to patrol it adequately to make sure that none of these things happen. So you, you, find, you find the arguments in favor of your project to try to counter the arguments against your project. Hmm. I have a question. Yeah. It, it just, you mentioned something earlier. In terms of the marijuana dispensaries, is there a lot of traffic associated with them? We, it, it's... I'm, I'm, just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious to know if it, if it actually increases traffic counts. And um, I, I don't think so. There's not a lot of data okay. yet. So I don't know about in Florida, but in Massachusetts, as it Where they currently have stands, yes, um, the marijuana dispensaries, the lines of traffic are 45 minutes to an hour and you're sitting in your car waiting to get a parking spot. Oh, or you wow. either get shipped Sorry, by a uh, bus from a parking lot <laughs> no, far out of the city. You need a drive-thru. Yeah. Yeah. So, about so, so, so that's how it is in Boston. data for, from states that have recreational <laughs> use <laughs> might be interesting but of course in Florida we have only medical marijuana mm -hmm. permitted. We have no recreational sales. So I have not yet found a traffic study on um, medical, uh, medical only. Mm -hmm. From, so I, I don't know why, I don't know if it, it states move from medical to recreational so fast that nobody gets a study done. I, <laughs> I, I, I truly don't know. Uh, but the anecdotal information that my clients tell me is that they really only have about, um, even for pretty large stores, you know, 30 or 40 sales a day, which is just, oh, wow. you know, because they do a lot of delivery. Oh. Um, there is, there's delivery throughout Florida. So, and the population that uses medical marijuana is a very, very vulnerable population. So they don't dash out to buy that medicine casually the way that they, um, they, they might need a caregiver to go get it for them because they're that sick. Mm. 
-hmm. So right now, I don't think that medical marijuana dispensaries in Florida create much traffic. How can they deliver, like if a cop pulls over a, a delivery truck full of medical marijuana? I mean, it's just like, when you well, said it, that delivery, I, I didn't even it, it's, it's. I think that that's one reason that Florida chose what's called a vertical, uh, a vertical, vertically integrated model. So to become licensed as a medical marijuana provider, you, the same entity has to grow it, produce ah. it, transport it, sell it, and if there's delivery involved, deliver it. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a huge barrier to entry. It, it, I, I have heard that, that argument, yes, that, um, <laughs> that it is. But MMTCs in Florida have to be vertically integrated. They have to be able to trace their product, what they say, from seed to sale. Wow. Um, genetically, even. It's like they have to trace every bit of product that they grow. So it is employees of a licensed MMTC who are conducting the delivery. So that's why they are legally authorized to have possession of it for delivery. This, this is, sorry I'm getting off topic, but does each employee have to get a um, license or something like that for that type of business? Yeah. Well, they have to do back. I think they have to do background checks. You know, I'm working on the local permitting side of dispensaries. My our office in Tallahassee is representing them on some of the, several companies and some of the licensing issues. But I'm not as familiar with the state licensing as I am with just the local use stuff. Um, but that is one reason. Thank you, that's John. Those those lands that you grow are just so agricultural. The the growing. Well, actually, I think. It has to be in the it's enclosed. It has to be enclosed. Yeah, it's completely enclosed. There's a we saw 25 acre parcel Miami Dade it's selling for 3.5 million. We saw what? 25 acre parcel for sale in Miami Dade for a specific cannabis. For cannabis production, for but it, it's it's done in in grow houses. I mean, you know, industrial buildings can be converted to it, but um, nurseries. Uh, Nursery buildings can be used for it too. Security upgrades must be a nightmare. Huh? The security, security upgrades must be a nightmare, cost wise. Oh. I, I, the security is very demanding, I understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's an interesting I, I like I like, I like oh. working with emerging emerging industries, so I'm trying to learn about it. Um, and and when I take cookies to the public hearings they all <laughs> 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 Procedure for resigning. I hope that we see if I've got a, an email from our guest speaker that he's lost. Yeah. It's not coming. Is that Jackson? It was a public hearing. He and I were together at a public hearing in St. Augustine that went long that made me miss my flight back from Jacksonville. I. Unexpected night at a Doubletree Airport hotel in Jacksonville with no luggage. It was like, ugh. Uh, <laughs> it's not a cookie. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think how much. You guys send it. Well, we're in the middle of rezoning. And some of your case studies, you're going to be doing rezonings as opposed to comp plan amendments. So let's, get, let's kind of chew through the process. So rezoning begins with application. Um, but when you know your project is going to need a rezoning, it's highly recommended that you get to know your neighbors as soon as possible, right? And start having that discussion with your neighborhood association or the adjacent condominium associations to find out as soon as possible what their position on your project might be and what their concerns are. Get ahead of the politics. Um, a lot of cities now have mandatory neighborhood meetings for everything, for site plans, for conditional uses, not as, as well as rezonings. So they mandate that you go out and meet with the neighborhood association that you provide them with some minimum level of information and then produce a report and tell the city what changes 
you've made to your project to accommodate concerns of the neighbors. So some cities in Davie, for example, they have a mandatory neighborhood meeting requirement. In Oakland Park, they have just, in the last year or so, adopted a mandatory neighborhood information meeting requirement. In some cities like Fort Lauderdale, it's encouraged. But the city of Fort Lauderdale has a comment website that they just, if, if you don't go meet with the neighborhood and hear those comments sort of in private, you're going to see them in the comment website going to the every single elected official. So you want to hear them early so you can accommodate. You can make the change if it's an easy change. You can figure out the response. This might sound stupid, but is Oakland Park a city? Yes. Oakland Park is a city, yes. I thought Fort Lauderdale no, jurisdiction is separate. for uh, north of Oakland Park Boulevard. It 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 wraps around it, yes. so oh. it, um, it, it yeah it kind of goes up I ninety five and they've got a water treatment plant and they've got the executive airport and the city of Oakland Park is kind of in the C okay. shape. Uh, it wraps around it. Yeah, city of, it's there's the city of Oakland Park. Yeah. Medical marijuana dispensaries in Florida have an average of five hundred eighty nine trips per day. How many? Says who? Says the traffic study for. Really? Yes. How many was the traffic? 589 daily average, like average annual daily trips. Wow. And I would want to dig into that because if, if the trip generation rate came from a recreational, from well, a state it, with recreational use, I would say it's not really valid. It looks like she used, yeah, she used the marijuana dispensary rate from the IT journal with mixed with a shopping center and a medical office. So, I mean, I would have to look at this. What kind of medical uh, office? Like McMahon? Who did the who did the traffic study? <laughs> what kind of medical office? Just general medical. So it's not the kind where it's like the doctor is like low key in on it, signs the paper. I was just thinking that I was like, ooh, this is a class scenario. <laughs> Why am I not involved? Let's watch this. Yeah, <laughs> 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 so excited. Less than a month. I would really pay for it. Okay. Yeah, no, I will look for it. Because I was really bought the second. I, I will. Is that only cost? I will find it for, for, for a project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but traffic, traffic and parking are two things that generate a lot of debate because the they can be counted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of other things about the impact of the use is very amorphous. It's all a matter of judgment. It's a perception. Um, you know, you might like 24-hour donut shops, and you might think that 24-hour donut shops are always shoddy and sketchy, and you don't want them in, in your neighborhood. <laughs> but that's you, you can't count a number. <laughs> Parking and traffic are quantifiable, and so they become the focus of these debates very frequently. Okay, so get to know your neighbors, identify the active homeowner associations and the likely opposition, try to draw them out early, find out what their concerns are and figure out a way to address them early in the process. And if nothing else, you can tell the elected officials, look, I've been reaching out to these people for four months and they wouldn't meet with us. Or I've been reaching out to them for four months and we've had three meetings mm -hmm. and we tried our best. So. If they know that you have been talking to your neighborhood, to, to your neighbors, and it all doesn't land on the shoulders of the elected official to be the first one to air the grievances of the neighbors, you're helping the elected official reach the decision that you want. Mm -hmm. So review by staff. Some cities put a rezoning application into the development review process to all the different agencies, just like they would a site plan. Some of them, they see rezoning as a more narrow planning analysis. Okay, it doesn't matter what water and sewer or police think about rezoning because it's just sort of a theoretical approval until you come in with a site plan. So some of them limit the review to just the planners. They send you to the planning board and then to the city commission without circulating the rezoning proposal any further. Almost all rezonings, they require 
uh, public notice. If nothing else, notice of the adoption of an ordinance, which is a statutory process. But typically, they require you to demonstrate that you've mailed a notice or they have you pay a fee so that they mail notice to property owners within some particular radius, 200 feet, 500 feet, something like that. Then in a typical rezoning process, you're gonna to go to an advisory board. Now there's two reasons local governments have these planning advisory boards. They were always part of the model zoning code. The idea was to have a forum in which the vision of the community could be discussed or the, or the overall plan could be discussed and you would put um, experts, architects and so on, business people on that advisory board. When, when the law in Florida moved away from that Model Zoning Act and we get the Comprehensive Planning Statute, the Comprehensive Plan Statute requires something called a local planning agency to act as an advisory body and a body where the public can come together and have, have discussion about the plan. It's called, so the shorthand, it's called an LPA. So in most of these jurisdictions, the planning board is advisory on all kinds of things, and it also functions as the local planning agency under the comprehensive plan. In some cities, not the way, in some cities the city commission retains all of that control and all of that review. But usually, most rezonings you're gonna get sent to an advisory board um, where there will be at least one public hearing and that is, if you haven't done your diligence with neighborhood associations, that may be the very first place where you hear whether the neighbors support the rezoning or oppose it. It's at that public hearing. The advisory board typically generates some sort of recommendation to, a, to the city commission or the county commission. Now, it would always be best, right, to get a recommendation of approval because you're walking into a city commission or a county commission meeting with that positive decision behind you. But sometimes you just need to get out. <laughs> take your deny, take your recommendation of denial and move on to the city commission where you have an opportunity to educate them a second time about the benefit of the project because the city commission isn't bound by the advisory action of a planning board it's just an advisory action if the record in front of the planning board is really really strongly against you it can be difficult to overcome the real facts on which the planning board recommended denial but you nonetheless have a legal right to make the argument from scratch and convince the elected officials to approve your rezoning notwithstanding that the planning board recommended denial Sometimes that's the first place where you find out what the issue is. You find out that, you know, you wanted 10 units per acre, and if you would just agree to restrict the property to a little less density, they'd be fine with it. So that may be where you hear what the problem is, what the objection is, and it's an objection that you can satisfy. So sometime between the planning board hearing and your city commission hearing, maybe you can modify your rezoning in some way or voluntarily restrict the uses permitted in your new zoning to get the approval, to get the support for the approval that you need. City or county commission. In Florida, this is either one or two hearings. It's kind of a weird statutory thing. County commissions can adopt ordinances on one hearing and city commissions need two. Okay. You're in the first step of your project. You've the clock is running on your contingency under your purchase and sale contract. You've got to get your entitlements by a certain number of days or else decide to terminate your contract. It was a great price. It was a great piece of property. You don't want to have to terminate. You want to get your entitlements so you can move, go on and close. But you're in front of the city commission and they deny your rezoning. you got to figure out what, what your options are. Site-specific rezonings versus broad-based rezonings. Remember when I said that the Bonaventure, um, the West Golf Course was rezoned in a way that didn't provide any specific notice to the property owner? Okay, that's because there's two kinds of rezonings in Florida. There are legislative rezonings and quasi-judicial rezonings. It used to be that every single rezoning 
was as if the Congress of the United States was taking action on a bill. It was treated like uh, a big policy change to the code of that city. In reality, it was changing regulations that applied to a single piece of land. So the Florida Supreme Court split in a, in a decision, said you gotta treat these two different kinds of zone, rezonings differently. Site-specific rezonings that only affect the property of one person or a small number of people that are the subject of an application. So I have this property under contract. I want to change the zoning. I'm applying for the rezoning. Those are called site-specific, and they have a process. Big rezonings where we are the city government. We have all this egg land that's sitting fallow that we want to provide a big master plan for its future development. So we're going to change the zoning on 2,000 acres of our jurisdictional area. Lots of, lots of different owners in there, big picture decision. Those are legislative, yeah. Is there a specific uh, threshold that, that deciphers between the side, like uh, you said, big? Uh, there is an acreage criteria in the statute that I, that I don't remember at the moment. The minimum um, for it to be legislative? Pardon? Is the, the, the minimum number of acres, whatever number that is, to become a legislative um, rezoning? There, there is, there is a number okay. in the statute that I cannot remember. <laughs> um, but when, okay, you're all preparing to work in the development industry, so you're more than you're most likely to be on the applicant side, where you're considering development of a property, you want to obtain entitlements for it, so you're the applicant to try to change the rezoning. So that you have to understand is going to be in what's called a quasi-judicial proceeding. It means that the decision-making must occur in the hearing, and it must be based on evidence, not on a big legislative scheme for the whole city. And it also means that those decision-makers have to either avoid talking to people outside of the hearing or disclose at the hearing that they talk to people. So if you if you go to a hearing and hey Danny. Hi. Hi. I'm I'm uh, torturing them with quasi judicial process right now. So give, give me a minute until all of our eyes are bleeding and then I'll introduce you in here. <laughs> um, so quasi judicial proceedings mean that the decision must be based on evidence at the hearing not on evidence outside the hearing, not on nothing other than what's at the hearing. Um, and the other outcome of, of that process being quasi-judicial instead of legislative is that the courts do not give it the deference that they would give a legislative action. So part of the problem with zoning decisions that were all being done as legislative decisions is that no one could ever overturn them because the courts always said it's legislative we're not going to interfere we're going to respect the uh the discretion that was involved in that legislative decision and we're going to defer to it but with quasi-judicial proceedings the landowner who had who experienced the denial or the applicant who experienced the denial has a little bit more to grab hold of to challenge that denial in the hearing, you'll find that witnesses, especially expert witnesses like a traffic engineer or a site or an engineer itself uh, or some other kind of engineer will, will be sworn and they'll have to give expert testimony almost like it was in a court. The evidence must be relevant. So if you're in a quasi-judicial proceeding and you want to get a conditional use for let's say, outside storage at your Walmart <laughs> for your garden center, and someone stands up and talks about, Walmart abuses their employees <laughs> internationally. They don't pay a $15 minimum wage. Would that be relevant to the decision about whether to approve an outside nursery at a Walmart? No. No. <laughs> so the, the person running the meeting would say, your three minutes is up, thank you very much. Okay, but that could not be the kind of evidence that they could rely on to deny your rezoning, because it's not relevant to the question. 
and ex parte, that is communications outside of the hearing, um, are for a while under this Supreme, Florida Supreme Court decision, they were prohibited. And elected officials everywhere were like their heads were exploding because they were used to talking to their constituents anytime. You know, they're pushing their card through Publix and and one of their constituents bumps into them at the deli and they get into a discussion on policy and they're like, how can I function as an elected official if I can't talk to my constituents? So the rules changed over time and now what we find is that the decision makers are being asked to disclose on the record what their ex parte communications were about that application. So at least the applicant knows that that some sort of influence came to bear and they can try to marshal the facts and the argument to, uh, to counter that opposition. Appeal of a decision following a quasi-judicial hearing is based on the record below. Again, in the old days when rezoning decisions were all legislative, if you got into an appellate court, you got to start over. You know, you, it, there was no by, there was no one who was bound by the record below. And, what I mean by that is they were limited in their arguments to the evidence that had been entered in the original hearing. But now quasi-judicial site-specific rezonings, ex, um, the appeal is based on the record of witnesses and exhibits and so on that was entered in the original hearing. So the other kind, the broad-based legislative rezoning is typically though more initiated by a city to implement a new policy or a new plan. And those are legislative, and legislative decisions are deferred to by the courts typically. <coughs> and almost all of these rules on rezonings, as well as conditional use approvals, have, there's a bar, there's a, there's a prohibition that if you go and you lose, you can't make the same application again for some period of time, a year or two. We learned that those can be waived, Except. apparently. Except in San Augustine. <laughs> um, so that's rezoning. And we're going to stop here. And I'm going to introduce Daniel Beats. So Daniel's a client. He works for, um, he's the manager of real estate for Grow Healthy, which is a licensed medical mar marijuana treatment center. And we've been working on dispensary sites here and there. Uh, but he has a much more interesting background than that. And he's going to talk to you today about and stuff. Um, community redevelopment. So let's take a little break. I'm going to unplug and call my ride and get out of here. And then Danny's going to talk to you for a while. OK, so 10 minutes. You going to the garbage? Yeah. You should have just told me. I thought you were trying to be healthy. Yeah, top now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Design district, I think, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. All right. There's things that's what that, that's what's for the major. Especially like the uh, is for the first part. I get the second part because like sometimes it's so bad. Uh, you know, the, 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 the,
pretty quickly, so I found about $75 million in Brownfield public private partnership development projects, mostly on the government and the NGO side, the non-governmental organization side, nonprofits, and here in Florida, is anybody familiar with the term the, the CRAs? Okay, so CRAs are these community redevelopment agencies. They essentially help administer public purpose projects to try and do economic development and create jobs and build shit that I guess helps the cities and stuff. So there's an equivalent of that at West called the MRAs. So I was really involved with that. So I'm still getting used to uh, Florida. I moved here in November. It's relatively recent. Uh, but it's pretty much the same stuff after my research. And now I'm a real estate manager for, uh, it's Ianthus Capital. But here in Florida, we're currently called Grow Healthy, rebranding. Um, and we also have assets in Massachusetts, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, New York. Maryland, and a few others. Um, so there's a lot of real estate work, although most of it is here in Florida because it's a big state. The cannabis market here in Florida is larger than the Canadian cannabis market, and that's what you've all been hearing about. So oh, we yeah. expect it to explode pretty uh, crazy here. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go through a few quick things, but I am not a Florida lawyer or an economic development expert, but I do know some things generally about econo economic development from statewide. And these laws change in every city and state and across the country, and sometimes people are doing legal shit or illegal shit. It's all over the gamut. So it's, it takes a lot of research. But if you have the overview of the general tools and some of the terms, it might help you when you guys are building projects in the future. So that's what I thought I would go through. Uh, as a developer, you want to be able to take advantage of all available tools. Uh, that means banking, friends and family, uh, geographical tendencies, whatever the market is. And in addition to that, there's, there's some project challenges that can be solved by working with government entities in public private partnerships. Generally, it's going to impact your pro forma, pro forma. It could be infrastructure related, or it could generally just be marketing. Uh, sometimes it's just useful to have the government say that's a good project. So we'll go through that, as well as some of the risks that P3s come with. 
generally, people assume it's really cool to be doing a public-private partnership where you get news releases, et cetera, but there are a lot of transaction costs and encumbrances that come with it that sometimes make it not worth it. I've seen developers fight tooth and nail to try and get a P3 going when it makes no sense for their project. Um, pride or something. Uh, and lastly, uh, generally you should just know, as a developer, even as a homeowner, what programs exist and when they should be used business sense, how to evaluate when they make business sense. Uh, it's a tool in a toolbox, so you guys should be aware of everything that you need to build successful projects. I thought it might be useful to go through that. Some anecdotes generally on what this area is, and don't have to read all that, I'll summarize. Uh, but governments generally have to spend public resources for a public purpose. That's sort of the overarching idea of government, is you're not just writing checks to your friends and family and building cool projects that you want to do. Uh, so governments aren't also don't generally develop big projects themselves that might help revitalize a city. So they don't do housing projects, corporate headquarters, uh, they don't do a lot of planned communities, although I'll touch on it. Um, so, so governments can only do so much. And then private industry does stuff if it makes economic sense. Um, so in the long run, the presumption is there's limited land and population growth is at an exponential rate. So ultimately, private industry would take over all of these different projects. But politicians, when they get in the office, aren't in office for an entire lifetime. So what happens is po politicians will promise change with limited time frames. And a lot of this change they talk about is big infrastructure change, uh, changing the cityscape and building these amazing projects and affordable housing and things like that. It, but they don't work in 20-year in time frames. So what happens is the politicians really carve out and create these little schemes and methodologies to help spur projects on using government resources under the guise of public purpose. This has been supported in law. Uh, I, my little anecdote, it's pretty Machiavellian, but economic development, affordable housing, and blight removal have been continually considered public interest. There's a line of cases sort of starting with Kilo, although that's really a um, takings case. But there's a line of cases that basically say that, yeah, economic development is a public purpose in most states. And then other states commingle it, and really the Supreme Court hasn't let a clear line on what economic development is, um, although some people think they have. Anyway, so generally it's okay for these politicians to create these concepts that make private industry do projects that they wouldn't otherwise do, and oftentimes it comes with money. So a P3 generally is when a public organization acts in a joint venture with a private organization to accomplish a general pu public purpose. Uh, I categorize them as three general categories. There's light, medium, and heavies. Uh, light government assistance is, can be as little as marketing or just general political support, a pat on the back, a website that says this is a cool part of town. Really small investments on the public side can actually make an impact on a private developer's project. In addition, there's some types of general tax incentives. Um, as a homeowner, when you sell your primary residence, you're not taxed on that capital gain because the tax laws say that you're not taxed on it. It's with a political purpose of trying to encourage, you know, encourage people to buy homes because it's a good investment. That, that is a public-private partnership in some way, shape, or form related to real estate development. So tax incentives also have an impact. Governments have extended that beyond just tax incentives to actually subsidizing projects by foregoing future revenue streams, right, when, when a property so counties tax properties. When properties have higher value, the county has higher tax rules on those properties. But the county can opt to not tax at that higher rate or to increase basis or to defer tax gains for the purposes of assisting a developer with the project. In addition, they can invest directly via a grant for a general public purpose. We'll go through a series of grants that I think you guys should know about here in Florida. Um, and you know, I guess we'll talk about some other things you might have heard of. And then there's heavy P3s, which are government direct capital investment with levels of project interest. That means either encumbrances or long-term development agreements of some kind. It can be via loan paybacks, or the government will take title to infrastructure that they help develop with a private developer. So there's a long list of really heavy uh, P3s, and I'm going to go through a couple examples that I'm familiar with. Um, but it is, it is a really interesting uh, negotiation to undergo. Generally, the process is that in order to establish, so, so like I said, governments are spending money for public purposes, right? But governments can say a public purpose is X. 
So what they do is they enact a law of some kind. It's an ordinance at the local level. It may be a federal piece of legislation that basically says this thing, whatever it is, affordable housing or um, economic development or supporting minority community groups or social enterprise or uh, female entrepreneurship. There's, also, there's a huge list of social specific categories and business related categories other than the social ones that they've created public use categories for. And we can go through a series of them. It's, it's, it's very specific. Um, so they create this law that says this is a public use. Once they have the public use, they can create an agency. Here it's called a CRA, like I mentioned, MRAs out west, that actually are political vehicles to carry forth these public purposes. And they're funded via that piece of legislation, perhaps, maybe a follow-up piece of legislation after the framework is developed. But either way, this agency is created that takes applications for the specific program, however it was set up, promulgated via some type of regulation, or the agency just says how it's done. It can be discretionary, too. Uh, they vet the applications. They have some type of rubric. Oftentimes, it's uh, disclosed to the public, so you know which projects are applying and why certain projects won. And then they'll allocate funds and establish benchmarks, development agreements, clawback tools, um, basically whatever they think is necessary to carry forth that public pur purpose at the CRA level, which makes CRAs or municipalities that are carrying forth these laws, uh, sorry, these programs, very important to know on a personal basis. These are generally discretionary. You're working with one person or a group of people at one of these agencies that makes decisions related to these agreements. It's not spe as specific as you would imagine from a legal infrastructure side. And then they're monitored and reported over time. So oftentimes you can actually go look at a list. What did we invest in? How are these assets performing? And that, like I said, that runs the gamut from just the marketing side. So we started a program that said, this is an innovation district. You might hear some of those around the country. Uh, and they'll just track how, it, how, how it's performing over time. So it's really interesting to see uh, which ones monitor and report well, which ones hide shit, which ones, um, it's fun to dig into some, some of that stuff. So I talked about CRAs. This is the Florida vehicle for accomplishing these political goals. There's 222 community re redevelopment agencies in Florida, all established under Chapter 163, Section 3. Uh, the local governments typically prepare a finding of necessity in Florida, which is that promulgated rule, that enactment, that public use establishment. And then they form that agency, the vehicle, to deploy that program, whatever it may be. Uh, the CRA, that sentence doesn't make sense, ignore it. Uh, the CRA brokers that program then that supports those original objectives. It may be under state law or just the local ordinance enactment, whatever it may be. And they carry it. But, but the CRAs, since they've been established to support a program generally, oftentimes legislatures or even the CRAs themselves will piggyback additional programs on top of that CRA. They already have the staff in place. They already know the developers in town. They already have uh, geographic maps and reporting tools. So they'll take programs that may be in federal programs and run them through these local CRAs. So they're important to know on a number of different levels. Uh, okay, that's a big slide. Uh, general types of P3s. So we talked about marketing and political support where they establish a public purpose and market these through development agencies or municipalities, whoever it may be. Uh, you might have heard of downtown redevelopment zones where they try and spur urban redevelopment initiatives innovation districts, which are a tool to try and create jobs by spurring on technology investment. Uh, in the 90s, there used to be these trade zone concepts, right? So the cities would look at these areas outside that typically had some type of infrastructure benefit asset, a port or a railroad hub or whatever it may be, and call it a trade zone, an international trade zone. And they work to market it, just say, this is where you should be if you want to sell international stuff out of this place. Um, so that itself is a P3. And we'll go through some details there. But then we went through a few of these. It goes all the way from tax breaks. Uh, we'll talk about opportunity zones real quick. You may have heard about that sort of new legislation there. Uh, loan funds, where the governments, through CRAs, will actually loan money to developers for a public purpose. Affordable housing is a big one there. Um, job creation is another big one. But even as small as uh, facade improvements, like we want front of your house to look nicer, so we'll give you 20 grand. That exists all over the floor. Um, grants, actually, that's the one, that's the facade improvement. They do do grants. Uh, tax credits, which are highly complex tools. Markets tax credits you may have heard of, low-income housing tax credits. 
And then the full infrastructure assistance, oftentimes PIDs or TIDs, public improvement districts, or tax increment development districts that help bring infrastructure to major projects. It's like the opposite of an impact fee? Uh, yeah, kind of. So, so an impact fee, if, if everybody's aware, is if you put a big development together in the middle of a city and you throw a bunch more people and a bunch more energy there, it's going to hog up your sewer lines, your water lines, utilities, roadways. So impact fees generally are charged to big developers to help offset some of that additional load on the public infrastructure. It's the public impact of these developments. So TIDs and PIDs are exactly that. It's reverse. So the government actually invests to create that additional infrastructure for the purposes of spurring that development and proforming that major project faster. So it's, it's yeah, good point. I should put that in. Um, so marketing political, political support generally. We talked about innovation districts, trade zones, and revitalization zones. Basically, the government says, this is an important thing. We want to support it. Uh, take a random example. Down, uh, downtown Pompano Beach. We want it to be a really fun place to have entertainment. That's all they'll do. There'll be no teeth. Also, I know nothing about Pompano Beach, so maybe there's not a downtown. Uh, <laughs> but I did pass it on the turn. Uh, so, so they'll say, we want more bars and restaurants. But they won't do anything about it. They won't give any money. They'll just say, we want to do that there. And so then private developers think, oh, actually, that could be interesting. And then they'll raise money saying, well, you know, the city wants it. So I want to raise some cash, and it makes it easier for these, these developers to actually raise capital. Uh, for the trade zones, uh, when the government say, we want this to be a trade zone area, and they put a fancy website together and bring it up when they're at their uh, League of Cities meetings and shit like that, then, then tenants will find interest in those trade zone areas. So even though there was no financial impact directly to the developer, indirectly, tenants were more interested in being in that area because it's a cluster of different uh, organizations that are all doing international trade, and they share wealth and wisdom and whatever else. And so, then... I'm sorry, you're saying that this, just because the city put interest in the yes. project, that that makes loans easier to acquire? Oftentimes. Or, yeah, right. So when you put your loan package together, say, say uh, you have a situation uh, back home, right? There was a big initiative to develop downtown Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Both of them had these revitalization zones. So when we would go to CDE, CDFI, lenders, even general like uh, conventional financing, we would put that in our marketing package for the project. We put it in our tenant marketing packages because it was just interesting and they paid for some really cool graphic design stuff and they made it look fun and exciting. All that fits into it. It, it makes the project look better. Uh, which ha does have serious impacts on your bottom line when you're trying to go for, uh, especially when you're going for financing that's not conventional, but it does impact conventional financing and it definitely impacts the view of a tenant, especially if you haven't built the project yet. They want to see that really detailed marketing on what they're going to be a part of when they lease from you. Yeah. So that package is a huge benefit, even though it's not a direct capital infusion into the project. So it's really important to remember that sometimes you can piggyback on all of that investment that the public entity put in just by putting it in your tenant package. So the buy-in from the city's the... Exactly. The in addition to that, when they put these things together, the politicians say, yeah, we're, we got to make this thing work, right? We've invested in a marketing campaign that we paid X firm way too much money to develop this package, so we got to justify it. So they'll go to these, these League of Cities meetings or uh, uh, shopping centers conferences, and they'll promote this area as an amazing place to do business, even though the government's not doing any business there other than trying to justify their big marketing expenditures. And so what happens is all these tenants start calling the developers in the area who have available spaces. The brokers are doing better. Um, it, it's, it, all it is is they just allocated some staff time and energy to developing this concept of whatever it may be, yeah. even though it's toothless. Um, so, so it's important to remember that a lot of people leave that out when they discuss P3s, but it does have a huge impact. Tax breaks, easy. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, if you buy your single family residence, you're not taxed on a capital gain when you sell it, even if you sell it at 10 times the price, right? So it's this really unique concept that there's a public purpose to trying to incentivize people to buy homes as investments, because it's good for the economy until it's not. That's a Florida thing? Or is that a national? That's a national thing. Oh. So, so with your primary residence, you're not taxed on the capital gain. Your secondary residence gets a little more complex and they run out. But, but generally, and perhaps there's limits, I don't know, I'm talking to a tax lawyer, I'm not a tax lawyer. But the idea is it's a public purpose that you buy a home for the purposes of having an investment. It's, uh, 
know, the essence of the nuclear family in the United States and core of uh, you know, financial stability for individuals. It's good for the economy, apparently, and until they buy homes that are too big, and then the economy crashes, and everyone's <laughs> falling apart. Uh, so jury might be still out on that one. But clearly in the tax code, it's shown as a public purpose. So that doesn't extend just to single family homes. There's developers, like big developers, that also get similar incentives. Uh, this is an interesting topic here in Florida now because you guys don't have state income tax. Well, I guess I don't either now. But, but across the US, different states have also state income tax incentives uh, that have pretty significant impacts up to 9% in California and New York City on projects, which if you're pro forma a project out, 9% can have a pretty big impact. So they have state programs. What, we're, what I want to talk about today is the example of this is the Opportunity Zones. It's a relatively recent concept. Um, wild how they put it out there. They first put it out and it was almost entirely toothless. They just said, here's states, I'll, I'll talk about it. So Opportunity Zones, the, the concept was we we're going to spur redevelopment in low-income communities and communities that have uh, you know, challenges with recruiting jobs. So the legislature decided that they're going to allocate a certain percentage of total opportunity zones to state governors who can then allocate them however they want it. So there's this wild concept that the governors just got this like package of toothless geographical monikers that they could put on all these places that were all of a sudden opportunity zones, which meant nothing at the time. And the governors were just like handing them out to their friends and family. It was a wild situation. <laughs> so that's what they did, and somehow Florida looks like that. So all these little circle areas, I'm not sure you can see it, yeah, are opportunity zones. Like the one in Aventura? Sure, I don't know where Aventura is. Oh, it's like a nice one. Oh, is that like North Miami, like right here? Yeah. 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 Okay. So these are all apparently opportunity zones. So the governor of, the, of Florida at the time, wherever the hell that was, decided this is how the math looks like here in Florida. And uh, it meant nothing originally. But then they followed it up with some regs related to basis step-ups for capital gains taxes in Opportunity Zone projects. So now, if you develop a project in a designated geographical area called an Opportunity Zone that some governor said exists, then you can get some pretty serious incentives for capital gains. Capital gains, if you're familiar, are when you hold an asset for longer than a year. It's the proceeds on the increase in value, the profits on that sale of the asset. So if you have a million dollar property that you developed with you know, four units, and you sell it a year later, and it's worth $2 million, you have a million dollars of capital gain that's taxed under different tax code. I mean, technically it's considered uh, standard income, but it's taxed differently, I don't know, I'm not a tax lawyer again. But um, with these opportunity zones, developers who own these large assets can actually have that capital gain either reduced, deferred, or completely excluded if they develop in opportunity zones, which is huge. So if you own, I, and I forget how this works, if you own it for two years or less, then you have a capital gains deferral. If it's up to five years, you get a step up in basis. So, so if you're not familiar with the basis step up, basically it says, right, I developed my million dollar fourplex. It's worth $2 million. But if I hold it for five years, the federal government will now look at that and say, yeah, we know you actually got a million dollars of profit, but because you did it in the opportunity zone, we're going to say that you actually bought it for $1.5 million, and so now you only have $500,000 in ta taxable capital gain, which means that you re really cut your taxable uh, tax you have to pay in half, which is a big deal. Then you can hold it for 10 years or longer, you get permanent exclusion, which means if you sold that years later and you made $10 million, you pay zero taxes on the net proceeds of that asset, which is a pretty big deal. Um, other incentives for opportunity zones. If you're in an opportunity zone, it's become like this, this designation, right? So if you build something in an opportunity zone, states have just looked at it and said, oh, that's interesting. We're going to say that on our rubric for evaluating our incentive programs or our tax code, whatever it may be, if you're in an opportunity zone, even though we're not associated with the federal government, but if you're in one, we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll step up your capital gains too. Or we'll give you two extra points when we're evaluating your project for a grant application. Or we will um, uh, allocate additional resources to public infrastructure in opportunity zones. So it really became a, a tack on project. It was like, imagine a, a platform, right? You get the concept of the iPhone doesn't have any apps on it, right? But you can load apps onto it. 
the Opportunity Zone became like a platform that all these state and local governments started loading apps on into. So different tax incentives, different development incentives, point rubrics on grant applications, marketing efforts, all sorts of cool stuff. So know about that. It's still being vetted. We haven't seen really any of the results of Opportunity Zones, but it could be interesting. So. Uh, what if you don't have any capital gains to the firm? I mean, it's a great concept, and I've learned a lot about it. It doesn't matter. I don't have any capital gains. It's like, it's kind of a useless concept. Mm -hmm. But that probably presumes you're not paying other taxes. I need to find someone with capital gains to defer indefinitely. So, so oftentimes what may happen is if you're setting up your LLC, right, you raise some cash. Inside an project, opportunity zone. Fund. Inside an opportunity zone. You can reallocate taxable liability to different partners within your, your organization, whoever, whatever your capital stack is. So if you reallocate all capital gains tax to whatever your majority partner is, right, the guy threw an 8K or 80% of the, the cash you needed, um, then he could actually reap the benefits of not having that taxable gain because it's passed through taxation in yeah. some case, which are LLCs. So you can reallocate it as necessary, but for if you guys are developing projects, it's easier to raise cash if you can go to your investor and say, yo, it's in an opportunity zone, you're not gonna pay any capital gain on this thing in five years. It's a way better deal than the other deals you're evaluating. So it's good to know that as a marketing tool, once again, just like these P3s help on the marketing side, raising cash. So that's Opportunity Zones. We'll see if it actually impacts anything. The whole idea of like monitoring and reporting, we really haven't gotten any reports on it yet um, that are trustworthy. So we'll see what effect it has. But anyway, that's Opportunity Zones. Uh, when we go into higher level P3s, it's important to understand the idea of the gap in financing. So. Uh, your capital stack generally is, and you would know this if you're buying a home, right? Uh, it's generally, unless you have a shitload of cash, a portion of equity, so whatever money you put in cash, and a portion of debt, oftentimes conventional debt. But conventional debt will only generally finance for commercial projects a maximum of 80%, and generally it's lower than that, down to 40% of projects based on what they view as the future potential revenue stream. So what ends up happening is if you throw in 20%, but your conventional financer, who you've talked to, you've shown the marketing package, you've gotten the tenants together, says they'll only put in 70%, then there's a 10% gap in funding. Historically, this used to be filled by what's, what's generally called mezzanine or performing debt, which is really high interest debt that used to pass that 10% gap to make the project pro forma. But what's happening is economic development agencies since recession are actually starting to fill in that gap with different performance-based economic development programs. So it's really, really important when you put a project together that you understand how to demonstrate that gap because that's what these entities will fund. So for all of these new markets tax credits, low income housing tax credits, for uh, different opportunity zone investments, CDEs, CDFIs, all these potential financers that can give you like 0% interest loans, you have to demonstrate on an Excel spreadsheet with your capital stack, with letters from your lender, that you have a gap in debt. So it's really important to understand how that works. Um, moving forward, does anybody have any questions about GAP and capital stuff? Okay, I hope that I guess you guys altered finance. Um, so we'll go to loan funds. So loan funds, uh, we'll talk about Florida Housing Finance Corp programs, but generally these loan funds are set aside from a government agency that are used to fund a particular public purpose, right? So they'll say, we're gonna fund uh, creation of new apartments in Florida, so the Florida Florida Housing Finance Corporation, which is apparently a gigantic entity here in Florida for state programs, will say, we will give you 8% financing, right, up to, depending on how big your project is, at 0% interest or super low interest loans, if you agree to allocate a 20% of your net units from your project to low income, uh, qualifying low income groups. That, that can be huge. I mean, you're, you're allowing yourself to cut out up to 5% generally on these interest rates of your traditional conventional financing. So, so they administer these programs and they get really specific. For example, in Florida, the Housing Finance Corp offers an elderly housing community loan, which if you're developing housing that's targeted towards elderly communities, they'll actually loan you 750 k and sometimes turn that into convertible, forgivable loan or grant proceeds. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy what type of programs they offer if you fit the right niche. And it's all about developing and demonstrating that gap. So if you say, I want to build this uh, low-end community housing project in, what's the name of a rural town kind of outside of Fort Lauderdale area? Hey, 
Okay, we'll go with Gainesville. I want to build affordable, affording, uh, affordable housing in Gainesville, right? But the market rate isn't high enough for me to get this project done my, you know, by myself. So I looked at the revenue stream, I talked to my lender, it'll only give me 70%, I can only come up with that 20%, so I got a 10% gap. You go to sale program, which is the apartment incentive loan, or, and, and you say, look, I want to do this project, it makes sense, there's a public purpose here, can you cover that 10% gap in financing via a mezzanine loan or a for, forgivable note? And, and, and oftentimes they'll do it. And it's through an application process, so you just call up there, ask for the application, you fill it out, it's probably 200 pages, these things are awful. So, talking about the transaction costs associated with P3s, but if it covers your 10% gap and all that you're losing is your time, it can be a huge incentive. So this is provided by the government? Yeah, so this is this is a state program. Historically, was MESDED privately? Different? Yes, so oftentimes they take on these 18% mm -hmm. wild. That's what I was thinking is that that seems like a way to decrease your capital cost, I mean, yes. with a zero, and then it used to be Probably super expensive. It's your, the last piece. Yeah, but it used to be that real estate was exponentially growing, and somehow your house is going to be worth ten million dollars in the future. And, and obviously, that was untrue, which is why people have really rethought what that capital stack looks like and then what they can afford. I mean, there was even the establishment of new banking laws around uh, financing personal homes. Right? It's really hard to get a hundred percent loan, hundred percent note on a uh, house. That didn't used to be the case. You could grab like hundred percent notes on single-family homes, which is bizarre now to think about. But it wasn't back then. So, so this is rethinking how that mezzanine debt program looks, and the government is stepping into the shoes of what used to be traditional high-interest lenders. So it's good to know about these programs. They're all relatively recent as well. Um, what's next? Oh, so grant programs. There is a shitload of grant programs in Florida. It's awesome. So these CRAs administer these programs, and they get really specific. So West Palm, Palm Town, and Fort Lauderdale, the CRAs will subsidize 50% of your interest payments on the principal amount for loans on major rehabilitation projects in the CRA district. Meaning if you take out a 6% note to build an apartment complex in a city like West Palm Beach, the city will agree to pay 4% of that principal note up to a certain amount, sometimes $350,000. Which means that you look at your capital stack, you just cross off 350 grand for going through that application. It's a really cool program. They do not have that in New Mexico. Uh, Fort Lauderdale has it too, Pompano has it, there's a huge list of all these cities that will literally pay for part of your interest rate on your developer loans. Uh, housing investment, a similar kind of thing, Fort Lauderdale has that too, the CRA will give you a cash incentive per unit, so it'll just say, oh, you're building, uh, here, what did I say, 50 units, we'll give you 250 grand, cash, bam, grant, because we want to support housing development, crazy stuff. Um, and you can couple that, so you can, you can take down a 250k grant under one of these programs, Couple it with that sale program, which is paying up to $750,000 in a 0% interest note for affordable housing, and all of a sudden you're looking at an additional million bucks in your capital housing in your in your capital stack for a housing project with low income. Um, really cool stuff to, if you can piece it all together. So. Is that five grand depending on the size of the unit, or or does it matter? Literally, the program says five thousand up to five thousand dollars per unit. So I don't know, how, it's a discretionary thing. Hopefully you're good friends with whoever's administering the program and you can get that 5K. Uh, I do not know how their application goes, but you reach out, you grab the app, you look at it, you bring it to an attorney if you have to, or your banker, and you, you fill the thing out, and you can what, grab 2,500 bucks down a unit? That's, that's a huge incentive if you can pull it off. Take some clue, if you will. But these, these go as small as like facade and paint programs. So if you put in 25K into the front of your house in some cities, the city will just say, cool, here's 25K for being a good citizen. So you have 50K and you're, you're you know, invested where you only put down 25. And that's just to repaint the front of your house and like, I don't know, put some stone cladding on it. Have fun with it, right? It's an extra 25 grand that you didn't otherwise have that literally comes out of a CRA fund that's pre-funded and you just have to apply. Uh, commercial improvement programs will do the same for retail and retail development districts for qualifying projects. Uh, you buy a shitty strip mall in a relatively okay area, it's got four units, and it just looks terrible, right? Well, you can pull down an extra 25 grand just to throw some cash into sprucing up the entryways and get some higher paying tenants. It's cool stuff. Uh, business relocation, they'll also do the same, matching funds if you're relocating a business or creating jobs in communities. So Gainesville, speaking of Gainesville, has actually a really cool program for that. They'll match like 750K on your notes, which means that you're taking out a $1.5 million note as opposed to $750, even though you can't afford the $1.5 million note. Governments are wild. 
um, so to, to relocate a business. So there's really cool stuff to look in for every community. The, the rule of thumb is if you're building something somewhere, you have to go look at the CRA programs and see what extra cash you can take down through these CRA programs, which are like billions of dollars in the bank in these programs in Florida. It's absurd. Uh, here's a list. We go through them, um, actually. Where does this money come from? Uh, so we'll get there. It's tax increment. So what happens is these CRAs are actually being paid into by a fund because other developers started these programs. So what happens is it's just like a snowball, right? Mm -hmm. So if a CRA district expands and expands and expands and incorporates additional tax revenues, the county is foregoing those revenues because they view the CRA as public purpose, and so they're funded. So like a city like West Palm Beach has like just cash flowing into the bank that they're figuring out what to do with through these CRA agencies. Hey, aren't they going to be like outlawing those soon or something? Or they're not going to provide that is the reason that they're discussing outlawing it because what's happening is the county has foregone so much of that tax roll revenue into the CRAs, which aren't spending the cash, that it doesn't make sense. The counties are like, what the hell, man? Like, that's how we pay our police officers and whoever else the county pays. You're giving it to people <laughs> for paint and, and uh, stone cladding, whatever. Like. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's a bizarre concept. They, they won't be entirely forgone because there's been enough justification around these economic development tools in general, but they have to forego some of it because it's just cash sitting in bank accounts, people running interest on it, and it's not the government's. And the county is not getting the revenues. Who's running interest on the CRA? Oftentimes it's gonna be whoever the entity who won the contract to administer those funds was. So oftentimes banking institutions. Yeah. So you can look through here, but it's literally just a list. What are all these cities? So let's look at this one. Hollywood has a property improvement program. Yep. So it'll provide a 50% reimbursement grant up to $50,000, so to a $100,000 note, for comprehensive fixed capital improvements to the exterior of your property. So you're building something in Hollywood. Are you in the right district? Well, you can get a 50% match up to 50K, which means you can redo the facade. Right. Uh, let's go down more. Uh, Fort Walton Beach, wherever the fuck that is, has a facade, <laughs> which means that you can get incentive to property owners located within the boundaries for aesthetic improvements to the exterior of your building. Anyway. So going through all that, those are grants. Yeah, we have a lot to get through. I'm gonna move here. Uh, tax credit programs are much more complex entities, so this is gonna be the medium to the high level of P3. So the US government generally um, we'll broker these through a bank, private entity, a bank, or a CE, a community development uh, entity. Uh, so they can be loans or not, and it depends on the program. This is almost entirely used to fill that gap in financing. So it's a mezzanine debt or, or some type of gap filling uh, uh, tool. And you have to demonstrate need within that project. And literally it is done by putting together an Excel spreadsheet showing where conventional financing is, how much cash you're putting in, and where that gap is. And they will fund that gap directly. So in the application package, you send in an Excel spreadsheet showing your gap. It's wild. Um, so some two of the huge ones are low income housing tax credits and new markets tax credits. Mm -hmm. They can be some really massive programs. But in addition to that, we'll get into both of those. But there's also historic tax credits. So if you have a historic building, the federal government help you fund part of that if you apply. And renewable energy tax credits. So if you throw solar panels on the top of your building or you like have efficient AC units or something, they'll help fund part of that through a tax credit. So you can do it. And those ones aren't always gap filling programs. New markets are huge amounts of cash for specific projects. If you can win, I put together three of these applications. They are horribly complex. Um, but it encourages investment in low income communities. Once again, that's relative, so don't assume that your community is nice. It may not be low income. You gotta do the math on it. It's, it's sometimes uh, average makes 70% of median income in the county. Uh, if you're building next to university and you got university students, I don't know, you do the math. But um, these community, the CDEs, community development entities will apply to CDFI funds. CDFI is community development financial institutions which are awarded these tax credits from the federal government at the federal government's discretion through the program. Uh, the CDE then finds taxpayers who want to receive a credit for investments, who invest in the qualified entity investments, which are the individual projects that win. Um, along with the CDE, they get a 39% tax credit, the investing entity does, plus they get to say they did some good shit and avoid some other taxes. 
And then the CE has to spend that investment and participate in qualifying projects within their districts or within their scope of public purpose. Uh, the CD uses its expertise. This is the concept, right? The feds say, we don't know enough about it, so we're gonna allocate it to these private companies who know more about their communities. We'll let them administer the program. They invest or lend these funds. It can be a combination of both, and it can be into real estate or businesses. So you won't always see new markets just being in real estate projects, although sometimes they're the easiest to quantify. Uh, it's a very complex application process evaluated by each CDE in their own rubric and their own methodology. So there's these new markets tax credits consultants that just run around and know all these CDEs and the ins and outs and the people at them. Uh, let's see, I applied to one that only wanted to work on university-related housing projects. So if you weren't a university-related housing project, they wouldn't even consider you under this new markets program. But if you were, they would consider you no matter where you're at in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they'd work with you. So they, they get wildly specific. Um, allocations are very arbitrary, so every year they issue new alloca allocations through the feds to the CDFIs. It is unclear who gets them and why. I have to call and pay lots of money to consultants at the time to get that little tidbit of information. It's, it's highly discretionary. But these are massive, so you can get up to like 25 million bucks in new markets credits for specific projects to cover gas and financing if they're specific to the CDE's needs and the CDE got the cash from the feds. Uh, these can be low interest, for, they can be forgivable loans, uh, they can require you to pay back 1% of your project net revenues for 30 years into a fund that's then re-spent on one specific other public purpose. It's, it's every CDE will, will do it differently. Uh, some of your major CDEs are no different than you would generally see in your banking institutions. You're talking U.S. Bank, and Chase, and Wells Fargo, all have different CDE arms as well as specialty ones like the Urban Housing Institute, and there's a few others that are CDE's specific public purposes. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this, but generally it's, it's the combination investment from the CDFI who receive the federal funds plus the investor who creates the CDE, and they invest in these specific projects that fit the qualifications. Um, this, as we talked about the gap in funding, so say it's $15 million total project cost, and you only have 12 million and your 70% note from your conventional lender, New markets will fill in that $3 million gap. So that's where it's huge to demonstrate I've got a gap in funding and you apply. Because new markets will push you off the shelves if you don't have that gap. It's not just free cash, you've got to show you need it to make the project work. It turns out it doesn't take that much math to say you need more money. <laughs> so put in less equity. Say, well, I don't have enough equity. Yep. So you just Really? Know, move some funds around and the LLC all of a sudden doesn't have a ton of cash in the bank. It's, it's, not, it's not that hard to figure out. I mean, it's um, not like a means, it's not really means tested. No, uh, but remember these projects are generally set up in these individual entities. So they are talking about the entity that invests in the project. So the entity can accomplish it, and you're not gonna throw out a personal guarantee. These guys don't really expect you to throw out a personal guarantee. And I say guys, and I actually kind of mean guys, because it's pretty much all guys. Um, and they'll cover that gap, that additional you know, three million bucks to make the project grow for now. Uh, so, once again, it's a ton of transaction costs. You're often paying 1% on notes, so if you take down 5 million bucks for this, just do the math on 1%, that's a lot of cash up front, but if it makes a project pro forma, it could work. Um, then we go into infrastructure assistance, which is pretty much the heaviest P3 investment you can go through. Uh, these are long-term development agreements, so you're talking literally a negotiated document with two attorneys across the table, and they come up with this 50-page document that lasts for 30 years with a project. Uh, TIF financing is a big economic development tool. It's interesting to know and good to understand the concept of. There's unbonded TIFs, which means that these are what the CRA programs in Florida are often set up as. So what that means is they'll set aside certain tax revenues that just fill a fund over time until there's a ton of cash and people start saying, what the hell are we doing with CRAs? And there's public improvement districts, which are for infrastructure assistance for generally larger sub communities. And then there's tax increment development districts, which are highly complex development tools for like big shopping centers. So go through a couple case studies on that. TIF basics, once again, for every economic development tool, there's an ordinance or, ordinance or legal me mechanism that creates this geographic area and public use. We are going to redevelop X parcel that used to be uh, the old headquarters, of, what's that big one in Chicago? What was it? Chicago? Sears, big Sears headquarters, right? We're gonna pass an ordinance that says we wanna redevelop it. That's all the government's gotta do. They just got, have to have enough political will to get there. What they then do, and this is key, is they do an equalized assessed valuation of current existing tax rules at that existing project. 
So they will draw a line in the sand and say, this is what the project is worth right now. So that headquarters building is worth X amount of dollars on our tax rolls. Mm -hmm. What they'll then do is work with the developer to create a project and try and estimate value of the increase in value on that project over time. Those additional projected revenue streams, property values, that increment is what's created that makes a TIF. So right, in 30 years, this district, which used to be worth this, is gonna be worth this. Mm -hmm. But the politician doesn't wanna wait for that entire number to make sense, right? So here, theoretically, the real estate developer, the private developer, it pro formas out. So they'll do it with or without government assistance. But in the interim period, when X person gets elected, they say, we want it to happen now. So they will take the projected net present values of the equalized assessed valuation and create a package, a bondable revenue stream that allows them to go to market with a muni bond and issue a shitload of cash up front based on the projected increase in property tax values over time. So what they create is this bondable TIF. That can fund a ton of stuff. So we're talking $100 million projects here where you can take an increase in value, say it was 10 million, now it's 100 million. Over 30 years, that increase in tax values can be worth a ton of money. So they typically don't get smaller than about 10 million. These are big mall projects. We'll go through one I worked on specifically. So, so that's the general concept. Now in Florida, which is interesting, is they do a lot of unbonded TIFs, which means they will take this real estate, this, this tax increment, and instead of going to an underwriter, packaging up the net present values, and selling it on the open market at an interest rate for cash up front, they'll just say all of that incremental revenue goes into a CRA fund over time. So there's no cash up front, but it creates a revenue stream over time for like, I guess the concept was maintenance and stuff. But there's no way in hell it's gonna cost, maintenance is gonna cost the same and keep up with this tax increment. So that's why you've got this series of CRAs holding cash, because they didn't bond their TIFs instantaneously. So it's a strange concept. Can you explain that again? Kind of political, well, but that was kind of confusing. Can you explain it? I understand that, so the revenue bonds are issued for this gap and they're given them as a, as a lump sum, and then can you kind of explain the other way that yeah, so the other way is that they'll show this project, so they put this package together and they'll say it's going to increase to X amount of dollars and you've got this increment, so it's all cut out, right? So here's our continuing base EAV, this is without establishing the TIF. Over time, it's going to explode to this after the, I guess it's a 23-year TIF district. Geographic specific area, right? So it's only impacting the property value increases in a specific geographical area. But instead of packaging the deal up, does anybody know like the typical muni bond process? So the government will say, we need money. It's how the government takes out debt. So they don't go to a big bank and ask for a loan. They issue muni bonds. So they'll say, we want to do this big project, right? Just like you might do if you're going to remodel your house and you go talk to a lender. Instead, these guys go to an underwriter and go to the open market with a municipal bond, which means the city says, we will pay you back over time. But instead of just having one lender, it's muni bond purchasers. So they'll buy these bonds that sit at 4% interest rates for 30 years sometimes, generally they're 10 year notes actually, um, with muni bonds, and that's how they'll sell things. This is a muni bond, but it's a muni bond based off of one specific geographical area, and the revenue stream is that increase in property tax values, which means that there's a lot of risk in these muni bonds. Sometimes they can be higher rates, but people still love muni bonds for whatever reason. So if the developer fucks up and doesn't build the project, those revenues aren't coming in, which means the city's on the hook to pay back those mini bonds, even though the revenue stream, you know, they projected that revenue stream. So it's a dangerous game to play, but a lot of politicians say, we want that project done now, it's gonna make our community so much better, it's worth the risk. So that's a typical TIF concept. Now, if you don't bond it up front, those additional revenues still occur. I and mean, that's still additional money. But instead of going to pay back a mini bond note, those funds go into a, a fund, into a bank account. So they're not paying anybody back. They still have the base EAVs. They haven't increased the tax dollar amounts that the developer's paying. It's just those TIF funds are going into a separate bank account for future projects and different CRA public purpose goals. Does that make a little more sense? No, you went over it again. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll go through one. This is now in New Mexico. It's called the Windrock Mall. It's an old existing mall project. So this developer says, look, I need to put in a ton of money, but I need some help. This is way too big of a project. It's way too much square footage, but I'm gonna make it look pretty like this. Big park, right? So any city looks at this and the mayor's like, that looks
looks awesome. Let's figure out how to do it. <laughs> so they sit down and they say, well, let's look at a TIF-TID concept. So the developer says, okay, well, I'm willing to bring to the table through conventional and equity 100 million bucks, but I can't afford to do all the roadways, I can't afford to do all the curves, I can't afford to do the parking structures, I need help with that. Here's the old mall, right? J.C. Penney, Montgomery Ward, stuff you don't even hear about anymore. This thing is dilapidated, right? So there's public incentive and public purpose to remodel this gigantic parcel that's right along the freeway at a big intersection in Albuquerque. So the mayor says, I'm going to make that a priority, and I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. We're going to do a TID on this thing, which is that tax increment district. So the mayor marks out a parcel. This is the whole TID, right? So you've got the interstate here, Pennsylvania. They go and just map it out. Like Literally, these documents, these agreements, have just maps where stuff's like colored in and highlighted in these legal agreements that show who owns what, and they run to the title of the land. So what happened is the city said, OK, we're going to set up and, and first of all, we're going to establish an ordinance, right? So they pass an ordinance that says redevelopment of Winrock Mall. And the city, the city councilors pass it all, and they instruct the agency, which is a CRA equivalent, they're called MRAs out there, to negotiate a development agreement to make this thing happen. So then, once the political purpose is established, and once the agency, the vehicle, is established, they sit down across the table and negotiate a development agreement to make this thing happen. The development agreement goes through a long process. They are not documents that are like rocket lawyer documents. They can make up a lot of different shit that runs with the title of the land in order to make these projects happen based upon the political will. So in this particular development agreement that we worked on, what we're able to do is reparcel these, this property. So this is the full TID district, right? There's property values associated with it. We know what the tax rules all. All these have parcel IDs. We're going to replat it, first of all, which means we're going to redraw all these lines. And the city is going to take title to everything that is not within a building envelope, right? So they just drew like this. And they said, developer, you get that, that, and that, but the city takes all this, and this, and this, and we're gonna take title to all of that. In exchange for you giving us title, we're gonna set up a TID, we're gonna bond it, because you guys can put 100 million bucks, this can be worth, where's that gap? This can be worth you know, X amount of dollars. And so they end up with a ton of cash that the city takes that cash that they sold on muni bonds, builds all of the roadways, parking garages, uh, curbs, landscape infrastructure, and takes title to all of it, meaning they're maintaining it all, and leaves the developer with dirt parcels. So the developer's got dirt parcels and a fully developed infrastructure with sewer capabilities, electrical capabilities, everything they need, parking, nice. and so they can go pre-lease these parcels and build them after they pre-lease to these tenants. I don't know if they got all these tenants. But, but the concept is it just reduced that overhead and it made that pro forma so much better. And the reason it happened was because the mayor wanted to redevelop that part of the developer. So you can get really creative with how these development agreements work. Now there's a TID board that oversees it. There's a TID agency that administers and makes sure the muni bonds are paid back and the developers are meeting their goals of building these things. Um, so highly complex, but it made it happen. So there's a lot of useful tools out there if you can uh, sit down with the right people across the table. Another one. I don't know why I threw this in there. Um, so, so back in the Wild West days, they would, they would. Uh, this is primarily back in the 70s. They take this big parcel of land. This specific one was in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, outside of Albuquerque, right? Uh, and, and they would fly an airplane over it, and they'd resurvey the thing and replant it. They just draw lines and just say these are pieces of property, different parcels, no utilities, no infrastructure, no power, no curbs, no roads, no gutters, none of that shit. And, and then they would go to market and sell them all around the U.S. Invest in you know your piece of land out west, like the good old days and you know frontier days. And so they sold these parcels with no utility infrastructure, no impact fees were assessed at the time of sales. And so you end up with just a ton of these desert squares that were sold to random people around the Midwest, and, and they're they're useless. And one individual land landowner for one of these homes. Well, they weren't homes then. But one, one individual landowner can't support to build the entire roadway infrastructure and the additional connection to the interstate and the sewer lines. So sometimes what governments will do on the P3 side is they'll go to a developer that say, look, there's all these shitty parcels that have no sewer infrastructure, no water infrastructure. Why don't we create a separate property tax role, a special assessment district is what they call it, or in this case, a public improvement district, we're gonna bill everybody in this community, everybody who owns a square of property at one time under threat of foreclosure, and we're gonna take that money, not bonded, it's cash from the landowner, and we're gonna do it ourselves with the developer. We're gonna build this infrastructure. 
we're going to do it under takings. So have you guys talked about takings yet? You're taking private land for public purpose. So they'll couch it into takings law, and they're going to build this assessment out. They're going to take care of those impact fees and other things to make them usable properties. So governments can get crazy when it comes to this kind of stuff under public necessity, economic development, and all sorts of other public purposes. So these four people that might have paid $20,000 for a parcel, all of a sudden get a bill for 70K, or they say we're going to foreclose on your property. Well, you can do the math on what happened. They ended up foreclosing on a lot of properties. But that's additional tax rules, and they, it's still, the math still worked out to run the special assessment. So they were able actually to build this neighborhood under the concept of foreclosing on people who bought parcels without sewer lines and utility infrastructure. So governments can get pretty crazy on the development side if they want to, and if there's political will, political purpose, an ordinance established, or another type of legal mechanism, and a vehicle to accomplish it. That's the basics of P3s in real estate development. Once again, governments can do a lot with political will. Sometimes it's perfectly legal, sometimes it's illegal, and they do it anyway. It happens all the time. Do not assume just because the government did it, it is legal. That's why there's lawyers, but this is a really fun area of law to practice in because politicians do wild stuff. Uh, the key as a developer is to know what exists when you start your development or when you're looking at a property acquisition so that you can pro forma effectively. Talk to your local planning departments and economic development folks. They're nice people. They also know a lot of stuff and have access to these cool tools. Um, don't make it a goal because it's not always it doesn't always work out, the math doesn't, but it is a cool incentive if you want to like repaint the front of the commercial building you just purchased. Uh, but you can take product delays, just be careful generally, but otherwise know it exists. And that's P3s. Further research on TIFFs if you want, pretty cool article I like, it's a good presentation. And then for new markets credits, uh, go to US Bank, CDE, or a few others. Uh, new markets are really, really, really fun to research if you're a nerd like I am into uh, real estate finance. Uh, yeah.